Okay, hello everyone, we're making a start. Uh, I've got the pleasure to introduce the next two speakers. My name is Anne Reimers, I'm speaking tomorrow, but today we're going to hear, uh, or this afternoon, from Tyrus Miller and from Eric White. And our first speaker is Tyrus, and he's the Dean of the School of Humanities and a Professor of Art History and English at the University of California, Irvine. He's the author and editor of several books on modernism and the avant-garde including Late Modernism, Politics, Fiction, and the Arts Between the World Wars, and Singular Examples, Artistic uh, Politics and the Neo-Avant-Garde, Modernism and the Frankfurt School, Georg Lukacs and Critical Theory, Aesthetics, History, and Utopia, and he also edited The Cambridge Companion to Wyndham Lewis. In addition, he's edited and translated Georg, Georg Lukacs' post-World War II essays in Hungarian, with the title, The Culture of the People's Democracy, Hungarian Essays on Literature, Art, and Democratic Transition, 1945 to 1948. So a very impressive list of publication. And Eric White, of course, also has an extensive list of publications. I remember reading one of them in the Bridge Library <laughs> a couple of years ago, uh, which was uh, Reading Machines in the Modernist Transatlantic, Avant-Garde's Technology in the Everyday. And Eric White is reader in American literature at Oxford Brookes University and specializes in avant-garde writing and technology. And in addition to reading machines, he published Transatlantic Avant-Gardes, Little Magazines and Localist Modernism. And his critical facsimile editions include uh, Readies for Bob Brown's Machine uh, and The Early Career of William Carlos Williams. He's also PI of the Avant-Gardes and Speculative Technology Project a digital humanities collaboration which reimagines modernist inventions with avant-garde winning contemporary white writers, uh, digital artists, software developers, and maker communities using augmented and virtual reality. And he's also the co-editor of two new series on avant-garde writing from Edinburgh University Press, the Edinburgh Critical Studies in Avant-Garde Writing, a series of scholarly monographs and edited collections, and his companion series, Edinburgh Foundations in Avant-Garde Writing, which issues important experimental texts from modern and contemporary period as critical editions. So I'm giving the floor then to Taras Miller, uh, who is presenting a paper on transparency on, uh, on paper, <laughs> imagining glass architecture from Taut to Eisenstein. Thank you. First of all, I want to really thank the organizers and uh, so far I've been able to hear some really fascinating um, papers. Uh, I will actually mention that some of the um, terrain that I'm going to cross also connects with uh, a previous paper that I heard, that of um, Daniel Hockbarts. And I think you'll, if you heard that, that paper, you'll hear some of the, the connections in, in play here. So my paper considers the paradoxical interactions of modernist architecture employing the material of glass with practices on paper that include writing, drawing, collage, and montage. With its properties of transparency, reflectiveness, and lightness, glass was of central importance to modernist architecture's reduction of structural separation and material weight in favor of open, interpenetrating, and virtually or even actual mobility of its internal articulation. Glass could also represent a material on the verge of abolishing its own material presence, its objecthood, whether in the direction of a spiritualizing transcendence of materiality, um, as in this case of one of the uh, Bruno Tauts, uh, member of the, uh, the Crystal Chain uh, group, um, uh, Hans Scharoun in this case, or as an instance of an ascetic zero degree of materiality without extraneous symbolic, decorative, or ideological discursive values. In this case, um, I've given you an example from, from Mies van der Rohe. Intriguingly, however, this dematerializing or zero degree materiality of modernist class architecture found an important material support in works of paper, uh, works on paper of many sorts, both visual and verbal, especially in the utopian imaginings generated by the convergence of glass architecture and radical social hopes that emerged in the immediate post-World War I environment of political upheaval and revolution. 
paper offered a freedom of imagination, a virtual intensification of the mobility and plasticity that glass construction promised, and an ability to design in new utopian directions, even in the absence of any possibility to build, as with Bruno Taut's crystal chain circle of correspondence immediately after World War I. And this is another example um, from uh, Vasily uh, um, uh, Lukart. Paper allowed a free fluid mo movement between representational means, between visual and verbal means, between artistic architectural metaphors and actual artistic design, and between exploratory analysis and utopian visions. In a pathbreaking article published in the Architectural Review in 1959, the architectural historian Rana Banham looked back on the then canonical history of modern architecture and argued that it was necessary to bring the fantasy and early science fiction writer Paul Schierbart's visionary expressionist line back into the conversation from which it had been marginalized. And this is Oskar Kokoschka's portrait of, um, drawing of, of, uh, of Schierbart as, as published in Der Stern. Uh, if one applied to Schierbart the normal test for missing pioneers, Bonham writes, that of prophecy uttered in the right ears at the right time, he scores, he, Schierbart, scores more heavily than many other writers of his day. Not only were his architectural writings known and in varying degrees influential among a generation of among the generation of Gropius and Miswandero, but at a time when many spoke of steel and glass, he also spoke of water as the natural complement of glass, of the need to temper the white glare of light through glass by the use of contoured tinting. He spoke of America as the country where the destinies of glass architecture would be fulfilled and he spoke of the propriety of the, quote, patina of bronze as a surface. In other words, he stood closer to the Seagram building than Mies did in 1914. In this connection, it's important to emphasize that the distinction between the imaginary fic fictional and speculative architectures in Scherbart's novels, or the letters of Taut's crystal chain correspondence group, and actual avant-garde buildings such as Taut, uh, uh, sorry, this is an, uh, another uh, work of, of Sharun. Um, uh, so the Crystal Chain Group and Taut's uh, Glass Pavilion, which was actually built, the difference between these should not be seen as essential, but represent merely different sorts of materializations of common experiments in potential modes of human thought and feeling. In fact, the eccentric and fragmentary paper archive of materials that are related to this tradition, mostly composed of photographs, plans, drawings, publications, and texts, raise interesting general questions about the relationships between built space, embodied phenomenological experience, language, and graphic traces in architectural broadly, in architecture uh, broadly, not just in this particular avant-garde lineage. Following the insights of Benjamin Deleuze, Lyotard, and Latour about the vectors that lead between two-dimensional paper representations and multi-dimensional co constructed space, we could, sp we could speak of practices of spatial folding and unfolding, transformation, reduction and expansion, and mobilization and immobilization with the architectural connotations of immobile intended. With this conceptual background in mind, I want to turn briefly to two texts by Schirbart, the first a novel about glass architecture entitled, in full, The Gray Cloth and 10% White, a ladies' novel, published in 1914, and from the same year, his treatise Glass Architecture, which together reveal a number of aspects of his utopian aesthetics of glass architecture. The novel The Gray Cloth and 10% White centers upon the adventurous life of a Swiss architect, Herr Edgar Krug, and his wife, Clara. Schirwart's novel is episodic, serving mostly as a vehicle for a series of witty, imaginative, descriptive vignettes of the extravagant glass constructions of the architectural master and the futuristic technologies of transportation and communication at his disposal. The title of the novel, The Gray Cloth, refers to the modernistic, austere garment that his future wife, Clara, is wearing 
when architect Krug first encounters her among his colorful glass exhibition hall, and which subsequently becomes part of their marriage contract. Bound by their humorously eroticized aesthetic encounter, Edgar and Clara fall precipitously in love and resolve to marry. Edgar, however, demands of his wife that she relinquish colorful clothing and wear only gray with 10% white so that she will be forever in harmony with his colorful glass architecture, which the novel portrays him as constructing all over the world from Antarctica to Ceylon to uh, Central Asia to Cyprus and North Africa. Sherbart's treatise Glass Architecture is the discursive counterpart to the, to the gray cloth's narrative Fantasia. Written in a series of 111 manifesto-like short paragraphs and published under the imprint of the Sturm Verlag, which was closely associated with the expressionist art avant-garde in art and poetry, the section titles veer between the practical, Magnus site and the perfect floor covering for the house, glass fibers in applied art, glass mosaic and reinforced concrete and ban vanquishing vermin, and the speculative, the beauty of the earth when glass architecture is everywhere, aircraft with colored lights, airports as glass palaces, the transformation of the earth's surface, a composed and settled nation when glass architecture comes. A notable date in the trajectory I'm tracing is 1914, when Bruno Taut constructed one of the most important actually built um, examples of expressionist architecture, his Cologne Werkbund uh, exhibition Glass House, which was sponsored by the glass industry. Drawing direct inspiration from Schirbart, Taut designed an elaborately domed and, fa and, and faceted pavilion of colored glass dedicated to Schirbart and including commissioned inscriptions by Schirbart about the wonders of glass architecture, such as Das bunte Glas zerstört den Hass, Colored Glass Destroys Hatred. We can see the close interaction between paper and glass architecture as Taut, if I may paraphrase Walter Benjamin's words about the textualization of the modern city, lifted Schirbart's letter from the horizontal plane of the page to the vertical plane of an architecture to be read. But under the conditions of World War I and the shortages of material and capital that followed the German defeat, Taut soon re returned to the horizontality of paper in such works as Alpine Architecture from 1919, The City Crown from 1919, The World Master Builder also from 1919, and The Dissolution of Cities, 1920. In his Crystal Chain correspondence, in which he exchanged ideas and drawings with other architects and artists such as Walter Gropius, Hermann Finsterlin, Vincent Hablik, Ansharun, and others, and in his periodical Frühlicht, published in 1921 and 1922, and I've, I've chosen a page from Frühlicht here that has on the left um, uh, the architectural model of uh, Mies van der Rohe, glass skyscraper about which I'll have something to say uh, just a little bit later and also um, a design of Bruno Taut on the on the right hand side. In his own carefully designed books, Taut uh, developed architectural visions that were not simply elaborations of a new architecture or new urbanism, but also schemata of a total spatial disposition to produce a utopian new man. Taut's uh, The City Crown, published in 1919, and with overall authorial and editorial responsibility by Taut, as well as additional textual material from Paul Schirbart, Eric Baron, and Adolf Bena, developed a concept of city organization based on the concentric radial garden city, but with deeper utopian aspirations to overcome the social and spatial disorder of the modern metropolitan of metropolis or industrial city. The aim is expressed architecturally above all by the high central construction of the city crown itself, the tallest city, building of the city, quote, completely separated from any purpose as pure architecture over the totality. And the architecture of sublimity is epitomized by Schirbartian crystalline glass architecture. And this is uh, what Taut writes, 
Coming out of the infinite, light is captured by the highest spires of the city, breaking apart and illuminating in the colorful slabs, corners, surfaces, and vaults of the house of crystal. This house should be the bearer of a cosmic sensibility, a religiosity that can only reverently remain silent. The sheen, the illumination of the pure and transcendental shimmers above the festiveness of unbroken radiant colors. And like a sea of color, it extends outward around the city's district as a sign of joy in the new life. Tout's uh, Alpine architecture, um, a portfolio of 31 watercolors with text, at, one, at once modulates certain ideas of the city crown and offers a self-criticism of them. Most importantly, rather than maintaining its vision of utopian transcendence within the inherited, if heavily spiritualized form of the Garden City, it now explodes the form of the city altogether, in a sense, expanding the Garden City to the ends of the earth, but in doing so, accepting an absence of the calculation of forms, symmetries, and districting intrinsic to city planning in favor of a utopian dialogue with the earth and cosmos themselves as measures of architectural shape and dwelling. Alpine architecture is divided into five sections rep uh, referencing the five-part division of symphonic music and is composed of illustrated panels progressing stepwise towards more and more cosmic dimensions, the crystal house, the architecture of the mountains, alpine building, building on the earth's crust, astral building. Tout subsequently added two further works to alpine architecture to constitute a trilogy of related utopian printed works, rehearsing in different forms more or less the same narrative of the passage from disorganized cities to organized nature to transcendence in the transfigured cosmos. The first of these, The World Master Builder, was an experimental theater, theatrical work that imagined a theater in which architecture would be the principal dramatic agent and would exemplify the workings of, quote, the creating and dissolving principles behind things, the world master builder effective in the cosmos. The work goes from uh, curtain opening to curtain closing and in between earthly architectural forms arise, collapse and become atomic forms that spin out into space, interact with the stars, then return to earth as light that animates the crystal houses of the new architecture built in, built in the countryside and in the mountains. And I'll note in passing the analogous use of uh, abstract forms by Elizitsky to tell a similar narrative of a cosmic reorganization of the earth in his constructivist children's book of two squares. And I've taken my slide from Theo van Dusburg's Dutch edition of Elizitsky's work to suggest the circulation of these avant-garde ideas among the international community of avant-garde artists. Tout's other utopian work the dissolution of cities, or earth, a good dwelling, or even the road to alpine architecture, nice long title. As the title indicates, it explicitly references the cosmic drama of alpine architecture. Composed of 30 colored ink drawings, the book also includes a literary appendix comprising 82 quotes, uh, pages of quotations from uh, political and literary authors from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Walt Whitman, to the anarchist Peter Kropotkin, Gustav Landauer and Leo Tolstoy, and the socialist founding father, Friedrich Engels. The work begins with an image of the collapse of cities, captioned with the text, let fall the built vulgarities, houses of stone make hearts of stone, now our earth blooms. On the principle that, quote, other contents of life create other forms of life, Tout advocates a breaking of boundaries of the city and their subdivided districts in favor of open organic space, expressing a clear anarchist um, sentiment um, in the rhetorical question, who now wants to draw borders? In a longer version of this paper with more time to trace out the decline of expressionism and the development of new avant-garde tendencies and venues, 
I'd want to focus on a shift of this spiritualized, dematerialized conception of glass architecture to an almost antithetical conception of glass as involving rigor, exposure, the refusal of signification, and the evacuation of a compromised psychic interiority and individual privacy. And in spelling out this narrative, I'd want to refer, for instance, to the pages of the Hungarian avant-garde journal Ma. Um, I know there'll be a, a talk on the Hungarian avant-garde um, later in the conference, where we can see its editor Lajos Kashrak's conception of picture architecture, Cape Architectura, a new elemental interpenetration of architectural form and typology with the implication of a radical trans uh, transitivity of architecture on paper and architecture in space in the concrete embodiment of the very essence of the modern present and ma um, in Hungarian means today. So we can see this kind of concretization of that present in, um, in Kaszak's uh, um, Cape Architectura. Um, another example, and you can still see that, that lettering of Ma um, in, the, in the title there. Um, I'd also want to pick up here on um, Koshak's contributors, Laszlo Mohoy Naj, um, who soon took up his role at Bauhaus. This is another one of Ma cover uh, with a work by Mohoy Naj that's actually entitled Glass Architecture as well as the Bauhaus-trained artist and architect Farkas Molnar, um, a couple of pages, um, again, from, from Ma, um, referencing this kind of uh, crystalline or glass, glass structure uh, skyscrapers in these, in these um, more or less elemental um, um, constructions. I'd also want to tease out in parallel the implication of the early Surrealists' fascination with glass structures, such as Louis Aragon with the Paris Arcades in his treatise novel Paris Peasant, or André Breton's famous evocation in Nadia of a wholly exposed existence in a glass house, where Breton writes, I, sh I myself shall continue living in my glass house, where you can always see who comes to call, where everything hanging from the ceiling and on the wall stays where it is as if by magic, where I sleep nights in a glass bed under glass sheets, where who I am will sooner or later appear etched by a diamond. But this would be for another paper and for another occasion. I'll instead leap to a concluding example of an artist who by 1926, 27, was imagining glass architecture not as a utopian alternative to alienated metropolitan life, to the life of capitalist modernity, but rather as the very epitome of capitalism expressed in spatial built forms, and that's Sergei Eisenstein. In a series of notes um, and sketches for a never completed film project, Glass House, Eisenstein imagined a glass skyscraper loosely based on Mies van der Rohe's 1921 plan for a crystalline skyscraper of a regular silhouette in the Berlin uh, Friedrichstrasse as a narrative device to generate incongruous montage juxtapositions and simultaneities that would disclose the peculiar character of capitalist everyday life. And notably, after, even after the project was abandoned, Eisenstein would return in his notes to glass architecture. So for instance, he has a 1930 um, journal entry that collages in a photograph of a Frank Lloyd Wright skyscraper project for, for New York City. Now, notably, when Eisenstein obviously sought to, while Eisenstein obviously sought to translate his thinking into the experience of film, like his projected like his projected uh, filming of Marxist Das Kapital as a Joycean circadian narrative, Eisenstein's glass house film remained exclusively a set of textual and graphic traces on, on paper, an incomplete project, but one uh, realized only in paper form. In a highly ingenious architectural realization of his montage theories, Eisenstein imagined exploiting the transparency of glass to present the privatizing, isolating aspect of the metropolitan apartment in its dialectical relation to the economic compulsions of capitalism. 
which was ineluctably overriding and superseding the private individual. In part, Eisenstein sought to tap into the satirical possibilities of filming, as in one example, a love scene viewed through a water closet as the camera's view passes through the transparent glass walls. More profoundly, however, in sketches that are reminiscent of his later analysis of Piranesi's drawings, in which Eisenstein argued there was a released pathos um, through the explosion of solid forms, Eisenstein elicited the transparency and interpenetration that Siegfried Gideon identified as characteristic of architecture based on feral concrete and glass and on the mobilization of vision that Mahoy Naj modeled in his photo montage for Gideon's Bauen in Frankreich or his own light space modulator in the 1930s film, Light Play, Black, White, Gray, his influential theoretical book from 1932, The New Vision from Material to Architecture, and his late experiments in plexiglass, such as the space modulator shown here as an exploration of the spatial plasticity materialized by construction in transparent materials. <clears throat> Indeed, many years earlier, Schierbart had already mentioned in glass architecture that the greater possibilities for shaping that glass and iron materials would allow would also shift the hierarchy of relations between the building silhouette and the ground plan. As the building shape becomes increasingly independent of its ground plan, the ground plan becomes much less determinative than when the vertical walls were a near inevitability in the, in the building material. Schierbart drew a number of implications from this, ranging from an individual's experience of a room where, for example, curved walls and dome effects can change the experience of horizontal and vertical orientations of space to the near cosmic in which the use of glass, colored light, and aviation frees human habitation from its earthly weight and gravity. Though he never realized his glass house film, uh, film, in his sketches and notes on paper, Eisenstein came tantalizingly close to imagining in the crystalline structures of a glass skyscraper, the radical plasticity of space and shape he also perceived in the animated films of Walt Disney. Walt Disney, Walt Disney. Um, I'll conclude by quoting what Eisenstein says about the elevators in the glass house, perceiving in them the mechanical pivot of a panoptic mobilization of vision through glass that has, in capitalist modernity, taken on the stern perspective of an overseeing and potentially angry deity. And he writes, lift, meaning the elevator. It's the pulse of the building, an all-seeing eye, Thus all eyes, everyone sees everything and the nightmare of exposure. This is the new paradise, first naked life, then the nightmare of eyes and visibility and the panic desire to hide. Magnify all the tragic aspects up to a biblical monumentality. And I'll end with the last two scenes, um, which have this kind of tragic motif of a suicide as viewed by various um, uh, people through the transparent structures from, from below. And lastly, the dying woman and the lifts. So this God's eye view of the lifts passing by and seeing um, a dying woman um, in, in the bed. So I'll conclude here and thank you. Thank you very much, Tyrus, for this fascinating talk, and we'll have the chance to discuss this uh, after the next presentation, which is by Eric White, whom I'm, who I've introduced earlier, and the presentation is entitled A Revolutionary Idea on Paper, The Legible Technologies of Bob and Rose Brown's Reading Machines. Thank you very much. It's uh, a real delight to be here, and uh, a special thank you to the organizers. Um, uh, and. Uh, uh, it's a great honor as well to be sharing a stage uh, virtually uh, with, uh, with Tyrus as well. Um, like most revolutionary ideas, Bob Brown's reading machine began as a very simple uh, thought experiment. How could technology transform the everyday act of reading to such an extent that modernists' literary experiments not only looked normal, 
uh, but formed the basis for an entirely new media landscape. By the time the Paris Tribune uh, unveiled uh, his plans to build uh, a book reading machine in January 1930, Bob Brown appeared to have found his solution. With tongue-in-cheek hyperbole, the anonymous journalist Monparno uh, announced that Brown's device would help their left bank expatriate peers, quote, absorb a dozen Gertrude Stein novels in an afternoon. Uh, in his interview, Brown explained that his machine would resemble a typewriter in shape, but be much smaller. He planned to print the text on a ribbon of tough, impressionable material using type so small uh, that the human eye cannot read, you, uh, read it. The medium, which he called the Reedies, um, uh, which he named after the talkies in cinema, um, would scroll across a magnification screen uh, with the speed and direction controlled by pressing buttons uh, and be stored in a pillbox-sized container between uses, as well as delivering a suite of tailorist efficiencies, which in the context of the Great Depression uh, emphasized savings and resource conservation, Brown promised that his reading revolution would also ensure that minor, modernist writers uh, will have some praise in their own day. He also inspired a new subgenre of transatlantic surrealist modernism. The Reedies were not just the invention for a machine, but indeed a moving type spectacle uh, which would condense and radically expand the semiotic capacity of the printed word, using a highly visual register uh, to suggest movement and stimulate paratactic, technologically driven strategies for cross-reading, which you can see here in this example by Abraham Lincoln at Gillespie. The machine never entered production, but with his wife and fellow writer Rose, Bob Brown produced Reedies for Bob Brown's Machine, an influential anthology featuring original work by some of those vanguardist luminaries, including Gertrude Stein, Ezra Pound, William Carlos Williams, Kay Boyle, F.T. Marinetti, and dozens of others. Um, to showcase the avant-garde writing inspired by Brown's Reedy's Medium, uh, and we've re recently issued this as, as, a, uh, as a facsimile edition, uh, along with my collaborator, uh, Craig Saper. Um, so, although these works were now, are now celebrated by uh, critics, the currently scholarly consensus is that the reading machine itself uh, probably never worked, uh, and that its technological innovations, while fascinating, were secondary to its literary significance. This paper contests this narrative uh, by exploring the origins and legacies of the Browns' multiple reading machines, from their World War I era Greenwich Village origins to the working prototypes built with their collaborators in the 1930s. In doing so, it argues that the Brown's paperless revolution in electronic reading uh, was bound inextricably to the very material that they tried to dispense with. Reedy's for Bob Brown's Machine mentions paper no less than 52 times, and traditional publishing methods stretching from hieroglyphics and papyrus to the Gutenberg Press. Yet he also imagines reading machine futures that engage with wireless, polymer, proximity control, television, and radioactive technologies, uh, and imagine hypertext, uh, versions of extended reality, and immersive reading technologies that are only coming into fruition today. Several of these technologies anticipated doing away with rather than conserving paper, but the story of the readies remi remains bound to the medium. My argument is that the Brown's textual experiments tell an important story about modernist engagements uh, with the palpability and materiality of reading, as well as the publishing ecologies of the machine age and beyond. Bob returned to his ideas for the reading machine, which he uh, uh, claimed to have cooked up in 1915 repeatedly throughout his life. He uh, inaugurated these ideas, according to legend, uh, while reading Gertrude Stein between scrutinizing his stock market ticker, uh, writing pulp fiction, and experimenting with imagist and visual poetry in the 1910s. The story uh, uh, took an abrupt turn when uh, Rose and Bob were forced to flee the United States in 1917 uh, as prosecutions against anti-war dissenters and socialists made prison a very real prospect for a number of avant-garde writers and activists. They were joined in Mexico by Mina Loy, uh, Arthur, Arthur Cravan, and other so-called slackers initially in an itinerant state of near-constant poverty. 
While living hand to mouth in South America, the Browns eventually used their background in journalism to launch a business communications magazine called The Brazilian American in Rio de Janeiro, which uh, quickly grew into a global periodicals empire. During this time, Bob returned to his reading machine idea, which he quite literally sketched out in a 1923 holograph manuscript composed in Rio. He grew the idea via collaboration with other inventors, including uh, Rear Admiral uh, Bradley Fisk, uh, sorry, who also invented a reading machine, which is uh, this contraption here on, on the left. Um, and uh, by J.R.C. Uh, August and E. Kenneth Hunter in Britain, who invented a revolutionary photocompositing machine that would allow micrographic text to be printed more clearly and easily than ever before. That's this contraption here. Um, Bob met with these inventor, uh, inventors in the mid-1920s before he and Rolls sold the business in 1928 to travel the world. They settled in expatriate Paris in 1929 to relaunch their careers as writers and rapidly developed the Reading Machine project into a co-created vision for an entirely new media ecology, which became the focal point for multiple avant-garde and other specialist professions in a global cottage industry spanning decades and continents. Um, but it underwent some crucial early developments in 1929 to 1930, in which Bob worked closely with two renowned modernist publishing houses, Harry and Carice Crosby's Black Sun Press and Nancy Cunard's Hours Press. The Black Sun Press uh, published Brown's seminal book, 1450 to 1950, in August 1929, as well as um, pre uh, presenting um, an extraordinary and distinctively American response to Guillaume Apollinaire's calligrams 1450 to 1950 collected Brown's first ideas about the reading machine, including his initial sketch of the readies meeting him and his 1917 poem, Eyes, which he published originally in Marcel Duchamp's uh, Blind Man magazine. Um, uh, and he reproduced uh, a, a, a micrographically printed reedy uh, for his uh, readies manifestos from that same publication. Brown's self-portrait calligram uh, reproduced uh, his 1923 sketch of the Reedy's medium. And you can see that kind of sketched out at the bottom here. It's a little ticker tape uh, uh, kind of icon there. Um, uh, uh, at the bottom left. Um, and it, this calligram visually schematizes Brown's embodied poetics and positions both the reading machine and his poem, Eyes, as the foundation of his life's work while suggesting a common point of origin. The machine age had energized visual media and in eyes the orb organs of perception danced to its accelerated rhythm, simulating a camera eye by zooming in on an unseen object of desire. In 1450 to 1950, Brown included not only a sketch of that me uh, Reedy's medium, uh, but also a sample. And this is uh, uh, um, printed in miniature three-point diamond type, which the uh, Crosby's helped him to source. And this promised, quote, a simple foolproof machine with printed tape like uh, typewriter ribbon running on before the reader's eyes. He produced his Reedy prototype uh, in the Reedy's, which is a, a crucial 1930 essay come manifesto uh, for the famous modernist magazine Transition. Um, uh, and its uh, revolution of the word uh, special number. This essay formed the urtext of Brown's project, and he explained it in readies for Bob Brown's machine. This anthology included another of his experiments in micrography, which he conducted with the British modernist Nancy Cunard and her Hours Press. Uh, his 1931 collection, Words, um, sorry, there it is, um, paired uh, Bob Brown's modernist poems with micrographic glosses visible only through a magnifying glass. Um, and you can get a sense of the scale of those just by looking down here, this barely legible smudge. Uh, but this is the poem, uh, this gloss poem uh, uh, in slightly more legible text to, to, to the left of it. Um, these um, uh, microglosses uh, are a, uh, not only a um, fascinating experiment in modernist uh, kind of paratactic cross-reading, uh, but they're also a um, uh, technical achievement 
uh, produced by a rough but ingenious copper relief intaglio printing method, they not only provide a proof of concept for the Reedy's medium, but also gloss the possible futures of their media ecology, which in the poem 1930, Brown imagines joining the mechanized transportation and communications infrastructure of the Big Apple. In Reedy's For Bob Brown's Machine, he collected 10 of those micro poems uh, from words, which form a kind of textual border here. You can see just on the flyleaf. Um, uh, uh, forming uh, a, another layer of, in his proof of concept. But equally, you can see why Brown became frustrated with mechanical processes of paper and printing. The smudging ink and imprecise characters make reading some of those poems impossible. So even before the stock market crashes of 1929 in the early 1930s, the consumer freight and storage costs associated with printed reading matter was coming under the spotlight. And the environmental devastation that resulted, particularly in the American pulp and paper industry practices, um, particularly when it underwent a mass relocation to the, to the American South, uh, were compounded during uh, the Dust Bowl effect of the early 1930s, where deforestation also caused, helped, helped contribute to the Dust Bowl effect uh, that was uh, ravaging US agriculture at the time. Um, the industry uh, is also one of the West's greatest pollutants polluter. Uh, ironically, though, the cost of paper, although higher in the mid-1930s, was not really a major issue at the time. As the historian William Boyd has pointed out, excess capacity and poor returns continually depressed uh, uh, prices in the raw material uh, of papers, particularly in, in, in America. But these economic and environmental realities meant that publishers took opportunities to develop and invest in new technologies such as microfilm and electronic media very seriously indeed. So Brown's experiments on printed paper, particularly with micrography, were important proofs of concepts um, to bear in fa uh, these factors in mind. With their collaborations, uh, with their collaborators, he and Rose uh, created several iterations of the, uh, of, the re of the reading machine to actually bear out uh, the viability of their invention. The first version, what I've called the Saunders prototype, refers to the working patent model uh, reading machine built in Cannes sur Mer in the summer of 1931, uh, which the surrealist painter and mechanical engineer Ross Saunders built into a wooden cracker box. And this is the, the machine uh, depicted on top here. The second form is the commercial design, which was sketched by Saunders uh, Hilaire Heiler and uh, the Detroit-based engineer Albert Stahl, um, also reproduced on the, the flyleaf here. It's this slick sort of laptop-style model with the, the reading uh, uh, kind of screen right at the top here and, and the mechanized rollers here. Um, this prototype was actually likely used in the third version, the so-called Radio. This working prototype was built by Rose Brown, Stahl, and the lithographer Hugo Knudsen. Um, Named after a 1937 sketch by uh, Hilaire Heiler in Globe magazine, which depicts a similar device, the Browns took this version of the reading machine to Russia in 1935 in an attempt to get the device built by the Soviets. Um, the electromechanical foundations of this device remained constant, but the materials and optical technologies involved in its implementations did change over time. Now, Brown based most of his writing about the readies and the reading machine on the, sound, the Saunders uh, prototype, the kind of rough, ready, mechanical object. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons why that the readings uh, for Bob Brown's machine contain so many references to paper, to newsprint, stock ticker tape, print production of all kinds. But did it work? Did this proof of concept actually go? Um, critics tend to think Probably not. Um, but retro engineering sessions with uh, my brilliant collaborators at uh, Makerspace and EOF Hackspace drew on archival documents um, like this uh, um, previously unknown uh, photograph uh, of uh, the Saunders prototype to prove its functionality. Uh, we used phonograph motor and mechano parts, just like the original. And a fascinating finding of putting this thing together was that the pinions were specifically engineered to allow for the easy reversal and the motorized reversal of this machine, which would allow for easy rewinding and re reloading. 
you remember VCRs, it's very much like that. Um, nevertheless, the reading machine and the readings it inspires have been trotted out as a cautionary tale about taking avant-garde inventions too seriously. So when the Browns returned to the States after losing their fortune in the second stock market crash of 1931, the narrative goes that the reading machine had to die too. But under scrutiny, this narrative doesn't really work because Rose Brown's contribution to the Reedy's project has been completely overlooked. Um, Rose's Reedy in Reedy's for Bob Brown Machine was one of the most innovative examples of a hybrid proletarian modernism which conjoined the radical poetics and pathetic technicity of the Reedy, of the Reedy's uh, with the social realist impulse explored by other more famous contributors, including James T. Farrell, who went on to write uh, the Studs Lonigan, Lonigan trilogy, and Kay Boyle, a prize-winning fiction writer and modernist poet. Uh, Rose was also an accomplished journalist, interior designer, and photographer, and these skills also helped her complete a portable, mechanized prototype uh, for the reading machine and together with uh, the pioneering Danish offset lithographer from Greenwich Village, Hugo Knudsen, it allowed her to solve a, a crucial design pro uh, problem that supposedly killed the reading machine, according to all the recent critical studies of it, that translucent medium that carried the micrographically printed readings. So Rose had been given a, a semi-functional prototype of the reading machine by Bob's cousin, Claire Brackett, and ingeniously, and against the advice of Brackett and Hilaire Heiler, who believed that it was too flammable, um, Rose and Knudsen finally produced a micrographic reading using standard 35 millimeter nitrate film. Um, the elusive Reedy's medium was sitting there in plain sight all along um, as parallel technological developments, including the 1935 Kodak Recordac library projector, the first really commercially available microfilm machine, uh, demonstrably proved. Um, as Bob explained in an unpublished 1937 article housed in the uh, SIU Carbondale archives, Rose came up with the extraordinary photocompositing method, quote, uh, Rose made the first, um, sorry, where did my quote for that go? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't, don't seem to have included it, but I will, I will read it aloud to you. Um, Rose made the first uh, moving reading film of all uh, uh, of Voltaire's Candide on a three or four foot roll, which is in the machine now. Rose had it done in one line of teletype, pasted it onto a roll of wallpaper, there's those interior design skills, uh, and Knudsen photographed it down to invisibility. Like other microfilm devices at the time, Rose's reading machine magnified the readies by poaching a photographic apparatus, apparatus the ground glass. But as a correspondence reveals, the machine was also battery powered um, and portable. In his 1937 article, Deflation Benefit, in the travel magazine Globe, Ezra Pound mentioned uh, Bob Brown's propaganda for a reading machine. And the accompanying illustration by Hilaire Heiler, who don't forget was a contributor to the Reedy's project, um, shows its robust functionality. The Browns eventually took this model with them to Russia in the summer of 1935, as I mentioned, on an exchange from Commonwealth College. Uh, sorry, this is a, a picture of uh, my collaborators building a, a working model of the reading machine. You can see its apparatus there. And this is kind of a, a model I wanted to bring along with, you, uh, with, uh, with me to show you, but it broke on the way in a very sort of Dada kind of fashion. Um, so the Museum of Social Change uh, was based in Commonwealth College, which is a rural social educational institute with strong links to organized labor and the Communist Party. Um, they set it up, up in exchange with Russia um, and took it there uh, with hopes of developing it, but the Soviets turned it down. They already had a television-based reading machine uh, on the go uh, 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 at the time. So far from shelving the Reedies in an ivory, ivory tower uh, modernist project, the writing produced in response to the reading machine charts an evolution in American super realist vanguards who are already responding to the economic crises of the depression. For example, Rose's Reedy uh, Dis in the uh, uh, Reedy's anthology was a feminist expression of American super realism that details working class women's struggle to survive the daily grind in Hell's Kitchen. 
And despite the reputation of this anthology, her work was not the only repost to various chauvinisms in the collection. Uh, Gertrude Stein's history, uh, We Came, um, deploys her distinctive syntax and wordplay to devastating effect as she cautioned that history is made by a very few who are important. Haridi presents history as a faulty apparatus rather than a well-oiled machine, which was open and permeable with its meaning uh, applicable to quotidian rhythms of everyday life. Rose's Reedy helped develop this impulse, and her strategic title, This, suggests the na uh, neighborhood Hell's Kitchen with its references to the lower circles of hell in Dante's Divine Comedy, but also to the negative prefix that puts working class women at that neighborhood at a particular disadvantage. Despite remaining politically, economically, and corporeally oppressed by the uh, relentless demands of the mechanized city, Elaine, Rose's protagonist, finds uh, the moral courage to persevere um, uh, 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 and care for her family. Rose tallies up and commodifies every aspect of the woman's day in the story, which she indicates with a persistent use of equal uh, signs. Playful and formally experimental, this performs the excoriating social critique that associated, that's associated with American social and superrealism of the 1930s. And she imagined that the reading machine could do the same. The radio could reach out to millions, so why not a radio? Um, removing the text from uh, uh, what the Browns perceived to be a propriet the proprietary confines of paper and bricks and mortar, mortar institutional frameworks was a liberating gesture, freeing the texts and their custodians to engage with the masses on a vastly econo uh, uh, expanded economic scale. Sadly, uh, all traces of the reading machines were lost in uh, the, uh, the Brown's travels through Brazil, uh, where uh, Rose tragically died in 1952 from, from an unexpected illness. Bob returned to the US, um, uh, but uh, although his um, reading machines writings continued, uh, he stopped work on the original invention. But interestingly, like modernist Forrest Gump's uh, and just to conclude my talk, um, the Browns keep cropping up in all sorts of electronic media uh, 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 from, uh, the 20th, from across the 20th century. Uh, in 1952, the Browns' friend Theodore Pratt uh, wrote to him from a Hollywood studio to enthuse about a new device similar to Brown's reading machine. The actor turned inventor Fred Barton had constructed a device that used unrolled um, uh, scripts printed in half-inch letters vertically on a roll of waxed butcher's paper mounted in a half a suitcase and cranked by hand off cram uh, camera. This was the foundation of the teleprompter. Uh, texts in which became radically simplif simplified for the actor. So rather than drawing attention to a new mode of experimental textual production, as the Browns had done, teleprompters actually made text disappear. Another revolutionary idea with its origins on paper. Uh, following the sudden illness and tragic death of Rose, Pr Pratt promised to look into the teleprompter further as a means of boosting Bob's spirits. However, Brown was already reconceptualizing the reading machine as uh, uh, a screenplay involving animated words and letters. He reimagined a poem from words as the kind of interactive texts that he'd proselytized about in the readies in which he can manipulate uh, electronic words with his bare hands in an evolving real-time poem. Rather than television, this concept points towards interactive VR and augmented reality installations only now being realized. These ideas on paper connect the future of textual technology with its origins, rooting a world of palimpsests and virtual palpabilities in the page, uh, even if only uh, 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 as a stage from which the printed word departs. From Brown's early sketches, uh, myself and my colleagues have uh, created an AR installation called Unbody with Jay Bernard, which helps the participant create visual poems that explore embodiment, trans identity, and digital haunting using the Microsoft uh, HoloLens. In addition, we've also uh, 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 developed the virtual storytelling application and toolkit, a free open source app that will allow you to create an interactive with those birds of words or whatever you like. So just to conclude, my uh, uh, advice uh, uh, I will relay from my collaborator, Ian Sinclair, is that when looking at these avant-garde inventions, sometimes the future's future is in the past. Thank you very much.